It's a path of rescue. And for that, um, we need to do a little bit of review. From Genesis 12 to Exodus 3, we see this. God promises a particular people, a particular place, and a particular promise. We see it in Scripture. We can see it in a family tree that you've seen me put up occasionally over the last year. And we can see it in the map and the history. So here it is in Scripture. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country. Abram was living in Ur, and I'll show you that on the map. The the land of Nimrod, right? Go from your country, your people, and your father's house, and go to the land I will show you. Categorically, it's the same go you guys are responding to. Isn't that amazing? It's the same one. But it's the same one our elders are responding to. Isn't that amazing? It's the same one. Go where I show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So there's this threefold part. Go to where I show you. Become a family that I make you. And from that family, I'll bless all families. In Genesis 22, it's even more clear. This is after um, Abram becomes Abraham, after the son that he never thought he'd have with Sarah is Isaac. In fact, his name is he laughs. And then God says, go and sacrifice him on the hill I tell you. And as Abram does it, God provides the ram on the very hill he'll provide Jesus. Right? There's no mistake what this is about. This is, I'm going to send you a Messiah, a Savior. That, that Jews were expecting and met at Christmas, or if they don't believe that, are still expecting. You see, that's the great expectation. His name is Jesus. But this is what God said in Genesis 22, 4,000, 6,000 years ago. I swear by myself, declares the Lord, because you've done this and have not withheld your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, as the sand in the seashore. Notice he doesn't say, I'll make them good people. They're rotten people. And remember our catchword, you need to see the family resemblance. Your descendants will take possessions of the cities of their enemies, and, through, and, and, and later he's going to say, but you'll also be 400 years in Egypt. It's not always going to go well for you. It's not about you. Just go. But through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed because you've obeyed me. So there's the promise in Scripture, and it's repeated throughout Scripture, and it's developed all the way to Bethlehem. Here it is in a map. Abraham, not by Hagar, because that's the Ishmaelites, who are today's Arabs. Not by Keturah, but through Sarah, through Isaac, through Rebekah, through Jacob, through not Esau. Through the twelve, through Judah, through David, to Jesus. The same promise is represented in the genealogy, and it's represented in the map. Abram started in Ur, spent time in Haran, arrived. The family began to grow. Joseph was sold into slavery. It's green because it was good for a time. It went very wrong with a new pharaoh. The new Pharaoh oppressed the people and put them under an edict of death. Kill the babies, the firstborn, kill the males. And notice, because Abram didn't withhold his son, God wasn't going to withhold his son to get them out of Egypt. It was going to cost a son. That theme follows as well. And in Egypt, it goes bad. And Moses is plucked out of the water and rescued, drawn from the water is what his name means. But He ends up killing a man and and has to wait and so moves away thinking all is lost. But God calls him from a burning bush on Mount Sinai and says, go, I'm sending you back. And it's red because there'll be conflict. That's where we are in Exodus. So Genesis sets up the expectation and the promise. In Genesis, it gains footsteps and footsteps, but the footsteps are leading to the birth of Jesus and to the hope we have to share with the world. This story is our story. Amen? You with me? Don't be afraid to be excited about this. (laughs) This is good news. Now, in every step of it, though, you'll find yourself. You'll find your willful, broken, gifted, 
blessed self and the God who's trying to rescue you and me. So the Lord now is appearing in a burning bush to Moses. Moses goes over and looks at it. This is review. We talked about this through Christmas. We, we talked about how Moses argues with Christmas, but how this, this is Christmas in Egypt. The Lord said, I've seen your misery of my people, and we say God sees. Remember that. Never forget that. There will be a time in your life where you'll be challenged. You'll be like the disciples in a storm, and Jesus will seem to be asleep in the boat, and you'll say, don't you care if we drown? You ever been there? Scripture says God cares. He sees. God says, I've heard you crying. I've heard your prayer, and I care about your suffering. God sees, God hears, God cares, so I've come down to rescue them, and God arrives. That's where Exodus starts. This is God's plan of seeing, hearing, caring, and coming. You hear it? There's, there's gospel in every inch of this. So now go. There's the twist. God sees, God hears, God cares, God comes, and he sends us. That seems to be the weak link in the story. But there it is, and it's not the weak link. It's how he works. Amen? He can use you and me. Amen. So go, I'm sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. That's the specific job of Moses. It may or may not be a job like yours, but you'll have one. But Moses said to God, and it's always but Moses, right? Said, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And that's the battle of life. Who am I? The self will war against God. Agreed? Good. You hear me say that probably every week, but <clears throat> even the holiest of us is a rebel. Amen? When you know that, you will have a much better relationship with the God who calls you every day to lay down your war weapons. Because the battle of life is, do I trust myself or do I trust the goodness of the one calling me? Now that assumes you're hearing from the Lord. Best place is the word, prayer, and fellowship to hear. God said, I'll be with you. That's our comfort in life and death, is that he's with us. Amen? He's with us. I remember, I tell you the story, but I just remember every time my kids suffered, the only thing that helped them was just being there. I couldn't stop. When, when Luke was born, he had no platelets, and they put a pick line in his forehead because it wouldn't work in his feet and his arm and his, you know, jab, jab, poke, poke. I'm thinking, I don't want to watch this, but my bigger thought was, I don't want him to be alone. God, you're not alone. You're suffering today, but you're not alone. Amen? How do we know that? God sees, God hears, God cares, and God comes. Bread and wine, Bethlehem, today, Holy Spirit, speaking to you right now, don't be afraid to believe it. And this will be a sign. Someday you're going to be back on this mountain. So I'm going to move through this as a review. Moses said to God, well, suppose, he keeps coming up with objections. Sounds like me. Suppose I go and they, they want to know what's his name. God says, I am who I am and gives the name of the Lord. I be. I'm the one who is. I'm the first existence. I is. From this isness, all other beingness be. Got it? I'm sending you. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I am the uh, I am. Jehovah is my name forever. The name you shall call me from generation to generation. The, the ground of being. So go, get the elders together, assemble them. Tell them, the Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob appeared to me and said, I've watched over you. I've seen what's been done to you in Egypt. And I've promised to bring you out of your misery to the land of the Canaanites. I'm going to take you back to that land I promised to Abraham. The elders of Israel will listen to you, which is ironic. For a time they will. Then you and the elders are to go to the king of Egypt, Pharaoh, and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Let us take three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God. If I didn't mention it, Joseph goes into Egypt um, because he knew there'd be seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. Pharaoh believed him, and it made Egypt very wealthy, and it made the 70 Jews related to Joseph welcome guests. 
that family moved down to Egypt. Over 400 years, they become 2 million. Over 400 years, leadership changes hands, and they become a threat inside of Egypt. So they become enslaved. They become hated. And now Moses, representing those 2 million, says, let us go. And Pharaoh is going to say no. And God says to Moses, I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless a mighty hand compels him. So I'll stretch out my hand and strike the Egyptians with all the wonders that I will perform among them. After that, he will let you go. Please understand, though, Moses is talking about, imagine a Nazi-run world and thinking, how could that ever stop? How, could, how, could, how can I go and ask the Fuhrer to let me go? He'd kill me. That's why he's arguing. I don't blame him. But God is saying, I'll take care of the details. You just go. Moses cannot see how it could be. You remember, I tried it. God, I killed a guy. Was it for you? I don't know. But now I'm in the desert. Go. I got the details. He won't listen to you, by the way. I'll take care of it. I will make the Egyptians favorably disposed so that when you leave, you won't even go empty-handed. They'll give you stuff. In Exodus 4, then, Moses says, what if? <laughs> if you have anxiety, you have a what-if problem. And I say, if you have anxiety, you have a what-if problem, because I have anxiety, and I have a what-if problem. There's a great Shel Silverstein problem about what-ifs. What if they don't believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? So the Lord says, what's that in your hand, Moses? And Moses was there with his shepherd's staff. A staff, he replied. And the Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground. It became a snake, and Moses ran from it. Here's a fearful, anxious, laden man who God is trying to use. And if he can use Moses, he can probably use you or me. I love that question. What do you got? Is really What's in your hand? Is God calling you to something? And you're saying, I, nah. what do you got? You don't have to have what the guy next to you has. What do you have? God can probably use it. Does that make sense? I'm not rich. Okay, he can use your poverty. I'm poor. He can use that. I'm, I, I ha, I, all I have is, that's probably what he's going to use. But you don't know what I've been through. He'll probably use that. And then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. <laughs> so he took the snake by the tail and it became his staff again. This, so this is sort of a sign, uh, a miracle. And God says, this is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, has appeared to you. Now, John 20, we hear a similar thing. Jesus performed all the signs and wonders that he did in the presence of his disciples and many more which are not recorded. But the ones that are written are that so that you and I may believe what? That Jesus is Messiah. Remember, life, new life begins. We're born again when we come to believe that Jesus is the anointed, the one sent from God, promised in Genesis and Exodus. When you connect to the plan of God, you step in to life, new life. It's, it's, it's the tractor beam of the Lord. That's how you're born again, by believing. Scripture says it consistently. It's what John is about. I think it's what the Bible is about so that by believing, you have life. And the great issue between self-run and God-run lives are believing that God is good and that you can trust Him. And when you do, you're born again. In Mark, we see the place of miracles. Jesus says, what's easier to say to this paralyzed man before me, your sins are forgiven? Or say, get up, take up your mat and walk. The implication is it's easy to say your sins are forgiven because that can't be proven. When in reality, Jesus came to forgive sin, which is the biggest problem we have, not whether our knees work. So to show that he has the power to do the deeper thing, he'll show them the harder physical thing. Does that make sense? There are miracles to, to give the authority to Jesus so that we believe. Not as a magic show. Not to just do miracles. Because we need to die, remember. 
So he says, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. That's the bigger thing. So he said to the man, take up your mat, get up and walk and go home. It's the same thing God's doing. Moses, I'm going to give you this trick, this power with your staff. It's not a trick at all, but this manifestation so that you can show the elders so that they'll believe, so that you can go to Pharaoh. But all of it is to save souls from hell, to forgive sin, because the biggest problem we have isn't how our kidneys are functioning. It's how our hearts are related to God and to others. Amen? Easy to say, especially when we're not sick. But who isn't? We're all sick with sin. So Moses put his hand in his cloak. Here's another one. Put your hand in your cloak. Moses puts it in. He pulls it out. It's leprous, white as snow. Put it back. And it was normal. The Lord says, if they don't believe you or pay attention to the first, show them the second. If they don't believe these two signs, take some water from the Nile, pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. Those are the three signs. He's not blowing anything up. He's not hurting anybody else, but he's showing that God is with him in the economy of that time because the pathway to Bethlehem is what this is about. Moses says another objection, pardon your servant, Lord, I've never been eloquent. So God keeps meeting these objections. He keeps knocking down these obstacles, and Moses just keeps bringing up more. I can't speak. I'm slow of speech. I stammer. The Lord says, I added that. Who gave human beings their mouths? Why am I showing you this? Because you and I have been here. And God doesn't pinch his head off. He doesn't blow him up. He doesn't send rap. He works with him. But he's, come on, Moses. A few weeks ago, I told you about my cousin who had the same objections Moses had. He died after 40 years of ministry. But I remember when he was having the objections, and I asked you the question, he was asking, what if I go? 40 years later, I asked the question, what if he didn't? You guys are going out on the field. You're going to help children of missionaries. You were both missionaries, right? Or children of, right? You know what this means. There's a lot of, if we go, it means all this. But if you don't go, some kids are not going to be encouraged in the Lord and won't have the trajectory of their lives changed. He's arguing with the plan of God And he's arguing against what God wants to do with him. And God is saying, listen, Moses, I got this. Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I'll help you speak. I'll teach you what to say. I'll be with you. Send someone else. I won't go, you You know, and I've been there. The Lord's anger burned against Moses. Have you felt the anger of the Lord? Have you felt chastised? Have you been? I have. I've had a chapter year end from not obeying the Lord. Have you? Because he loves me. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you. I'll send Aaron. Right? What about your brother Aaron? He can talk for you. It's not going to turn out to be the best relationship, but God can use it. But take the staff in your hand and go. When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh the wonders I've given you the power to do. But I'll harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will not let the people go. Isn't this, listen to me. Moses, go, tell Pharaoh to let my people go. But it's not going to (laughs) work. What are you sending me into futility for? Because it's not futile. Our first call to ministry was to a church that would have a, um, uh, we didn't know, it had already happened. Lori and I were called to a church where when we arrived, it became apparent that there had been trouble in the nursery. 
And the church had to go backwards for five years. And our ministry was to help them deal with a bad, bad event. Sometimes your call is into somebody else's trouble. And what the world calls success is nothing like what God is calling success. Faithfulness, even if he set up a circumstance where the world would consider it not growth. Does that make any sense? I don't know if I'm being clear with that. But sometimes your calling is into somebody else's mess or into your own or some, somewhere else where it won't lead to parades and growth visibly. But it will lead to people becoming faithful or the plan of God being walked out. And that bigger plan, there's a bigger path. That's why I don't know what has got you to where you're at, right? If we're being honest, we look in our lives and it's a combination of following God and following ourselves. We have, we have things we think are sacred and wonderful to offer to God, but we also have broken things to offer to God. And you've heard me say consistently, God is in the habit of turning ashes into beauty. Give him what you have. Five loaves, two fish. We can't feed them. We, we can't even feed 10 people. Give it to me. He blessed it. He handed it back. As they handed it out, they had more left over than they began. The key is, what do you got? What's in your hand? Give it to the Lord. But it's brokenness. It's hurt and pain. Do you believe in Jesus? Give it into his hands. Watch what he does with it. I, I can help at Kingdom Kids. Watch what he'll do with it. I can give a little. Watch what he does with it. I, I, can, I can help uh, do the security. Watch what he does with it. I can go across the street and, and hand, I can bake cookies. Do it. Because while you do it, you're probably going to talk about what God's done for you somewhere in there. Our testimony is our ministry. We didn't believe, we took a step. There's your testimony. We took another step. There's your testimony. I went backwards. There's your testimony. I kept trusting. There's your testimony. Amen? Say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says, Israel is my firstborn son. God is saying, Israel is the nation I've chosen. From this nation, I'm going to bless all nations. But it starts with this nation. Let them go so they may worship me. But you refuse to let them go, so I will kill your firstborn son as a sign. To all of us. Wow, what a place to stop. That's okay. God has a plan. He's up to something. Moses, uh, Abraham, take your son. I thought we weren't doing child sacrifice. Take your son. Okay. And then God provides a ram. Moses, go. I'll make a way. What's coming? The Passover's coming. The greatest miracle up until the resurrection is about to occur, but it occurs under the darkness of it's going to cost your son. Let's pray. Father God, you have the power by your spirit to teach the word deeply now into our hearts and minds. Thank you for how you're at work. Thank you for how you're sending people everywhere. You've sent people to Paola and from Paola. You've sent people into our lives and out of our lives into our church and out of our church. Father, help us to see what you're doing with, with us today. I pray that you show each person here that you are good. And that thing that's, that, that they're starting to understand is your call, is your call. Bless them in it. And help us to turn what if I don't go into what if I didn't. Lord Jesus, thank you, and it's in your name that we pray it. Amen.